uh, today we will study uh, Z transform. This is the last chapter of this course. Uh, we are expected to spend one week this week on Z transform. Next week, we will perform a review for the entire course, and then we will have a final exam in December the 9th, which is a Wednesday. Uh, the final exam will take the same format as our online uh, in-class tests one and two. Uh, it will be uh, it will be longer, but it will be open book, open notes uh, will be performed on Zoom. Uh, you will need a camera for the evangelization. I will send out the detail later, uh, perhaps next week. Okay. So last the chapter we learned Laplace transform, which we know that is a extension of the continuous time Fourier transform. Uh, the reason we need Laplace transform is because uh, the continuous time Fourier transform may not always exist. In other words, it may not always converge. When it does not converge, we need extension from J omega to a general complex number sigma plus J omega, we denote it by S which is the S in the Laplace transform. And the reason we need a Z transform is similar to Laplace transform, but it is extension to the discrete time Fourier transform. Therefore, let's first uh, recall what is a uh, discrete time Fourier transform. We have a discrete time signal X of N, N is the time index. It's Fourier transform denoted by X of exponential J omega is an infinite sum of xn weighted by this exponential signal, e to the power minus j omega n. So j uh, so minus omega n can be understood as the phase angle to this complex exponential. So there is a time variable, time index n in the exponent. And we can understand as the complex exponential j omega to the power minus n. So we have a complex number whose magnitude is one because exponential j omega is magnitude or its modulus is one. Its phase angle is omega. The exponential minus j omega n is like we increase the angle by n times. So this is the discrete time Fourier transform. But similar to the continuous time Fourier transform, discrete time Fourier transform may not always exist either. Let's look at this example, x of n, which is two to the power n times u of n. u of n, we know that it is the standard unit step signal. It is zero when n is negative, it is one when n is uh, larger than or equal to zero. Therefore, x of n is a right side signal starting from n equals zero. And it's weighted by two to the power of n for every time n. For this signal, if you try to calculate its discrete time Fourier transform uh, in the following way, just using the standard definition, x of n, we replace it by two to the power of n, but because with this right side step signal, the infinite sum becomes from n equals zero to plus infinity. And we reorganize the terms a little bit, two times exponential minus j omega to the power n for all the positive n up to infinity. So we found it difficult to obtain a finite result because for this, which is, a, uh, which is the summation of a series of common ratio, we can only get a finite result when the common ratio has a magnitude that's less than one. But in this case, the common ratio two times exponential minus j omega, its magnitude is two, which is larger, larger than one. So this series of common ratio itself ramps up to infinity as n goes to infinity. And the, the infinite sum also goes to infinity. There is no finite result. Therefore, the discrete time Fourier transform in this case, we see that it does not exist or it does not converge. And to obtain a frequency domain 
representation of a signal like this, we need extension from exponential j omega to the uh, variable we call it z. It's a, so z transform is extension to discrete time Fourier transform. So the extension is the following. Exponential j omega is, the exponent is an imaginary number j omega. And we extend it to a general complex number, sigma plus j omega. So sigma is a real part of the complex number, which might be non-zero. And we can understand that exponential sigma is the magnitude of this complex number exponential sigma plus j omega. And the omega is the angle, uh, is the angle of this number. And we denote exponential sigma plus j omega as z. Therefore, just replacing exponential j omega everywhere with z, we get an extension. And we can illustrate the We can illustrate the uh, extension on the uh, complex plane of Z. So horizontal axis, the real part, vertical axis, imaginary part. Previously, when we consider exponential J omega, because its magnitude is constantly one, so this number exponential J omega is always on the unit circle. Omega is the angle of this number. So exponential j omega is only on the blue unit circle. It's unit circle because it's centered at uh, origin and radius one. But when we extend to z, we allow the magnitude of z, which is exponential sigma, to be larger than one, smaller than one, or equal to one. And therefore, we extend from this blue circle to the entire plane. This is the illustration of this extension from exponential j omega to z. And this motivates our definition of the z transform, x of z. So for a discrete time signal x of n, we multiply z to the power minus n, taking the infinite sum for n from minus infinity to plus infinity. This result, in the result, there's no integer in x n. It's only, it only depends on the variable z and denoted by capital X of z, it is the z transform of the discrete time signal x of n. This is the definition of z transform. So let's look at an example. We have this signal x of n, which is a to the power of n u of n. So the previous signal two to the power of n u of n is a special case of this signal. Now let's try to calculate its Z transform using the definition we learned in the blue box. Uh, yeah, let's do it in two minutes.
Okay. We just calculate the Z transform using the definition X of N times Z to the power minus N, infinite sum over N, but because X of N is a right side sigma, this U of N, then we can uh, change the lower limit of the infinite sum to N equals zero, and then replace X of N in this region of N to A to the power N. So they were taking the summation of a series of common ratio. The common ratio is A times Z to the power minus one. And if we have used the formula for the summation of common ratio before. Uh, the, on the numerator, it is just the first term of this series. The first term when equal, N equals zero, the first term is one. On the denominator, it is one minus the common ratio. Common ratio is A times Z to the power minus one. So we can simplify a little bit by multiplying both the numerator and denominator by Z. So numerator becomes Z, denominator becomes Z minus A. But there is a prerequisite condition for us to apply the formula for the series of common ratio. It requires that the magnitude of the common ratio to be less than one. In other words, A divided by Z is magnitude less than one. In other words, Z magnitude larger than A magnitude. Here, both Z and A, so Z is a complex number, right? Because we are discussing Z on the complex plane. Here, A, if we didn't specify it, it can be a general complex number. Therefore, in this condition, we need magnitude signs on both Z and A. And this condition, Z magnitude larger than A magnitude, actually defines a region of Z on the complex plane. So we can plot the region depending on two different cases of A. We didn't specify A. So A can be a complex number whose magnitude is larger than one, or it can be smaller than one. Of course, it can be equal to one, which I didn't plot on this slide. When A magnitude is larger than one, we can first identify the point A magnitude on the real axis, because A magnitude is a positive real number. And larger than one for, for Z, in this case, for Z magnitude larger than A magnitude, so Z represents the region outside of the circle with the radius A magnitude. So this red circle, this red dash circle has radius A magnitude. And for all the Z's that are outside of this circle, Z magnitude is larger than A magnitude. And this, we know that this uh, expression of XZ is only valid when this condition holds. In other words, it, it's only valid on this region of Z. This region is called the region of convergence for the Z transform. Uh, we can relate it to the region of convergence of Laplace transform we learned last chapter. So the region of convergence of Laplace transform is usually uh, defined by a, the real part of S larger than or smaller than something. So structurally, it is either on the right of some point or on the left of some, some point to the right of some line, some vertical line or to the left of some vertical line. Or sometimes between, it is a stripe between two vertical lines, right? That, is the, that was the region of convergence for Laplace transform. But for Z transform, the region of convergence is the area outside or inside a circle of certain radius. Because it takes the format that the Z magnitude larger than something. Magnitude, if you plot it on the complex plane, it is the radius of the, it is the length of the vector representing a, a complex number. The length larger than some point, then it should be outside of a circle. Uh, similarly, when A magnitude less than one, so A magnitude, A magnitude less than one is inside the unit circle. But for this case, the ROC is still Z magnitude larger than A magnitude. So the ROC is still the region, the shaded region 
outside of this red circle, outside of this red dash circle. Okay, so this is the expression and the ROC for the Z transform of this signal. So again, similar to the Laplace transform, when we need to calculate the Z transform, we will not only specify the expression of XZ, we also need to uh, point out its region of convergence. Okay, let me look at the chat window circle. Okay, let's look at another example. Uh, this time, uh, X1 has a different expression. Uh, the main difference is on the step signal U, it is minus N minus one. We learned from chapter one that this is a time shifted and the reversal version of the standard unit step signal U of N. And for this signal, try to calculate its Z transform, again, using this standard formula we learned in the blue box in two minutes. Okay, to calculate the Z transform of this signal, let's first look at the structure of this step signal U of minus N minus one. We know that U of N minus one is a time shift of U of N to the right by one unit. So this signal is, it starts from one and the step is to the right, the right side. And then we make a time reflection, which changes n to minus n. Again, when we do the time reflection, we are only changing n to minus n, but the minus one does not change its sign. Since it's time reflection, the boundary point one becomes minus one. So this is a life size signal that finishes at minus one. And from zero on, the signal takes value zero. This is the signal u of minus n minus one. And with this signal, when we calculate the Fourier, uh, the Z transform of X of Z. This is the standard formula. So we have a minor sign at the beginning, just put it at the beginning. For the infinite sum, we can change X of N to A to the power N, but because of this U of minus N minus one, we need to be careful about the, uh, the summation index from minus infinity to minus one because the signal finishes at minus one. A n z to the power minus n, we can change the variable a little bit. So this actually contains a substitution of variable, uh, m equals minus n, but we just use the same notation. We change from n to minus n. 
So n to minus n, minus n to n, as we flip the sign, we need to flip the sign for the uh, summation index as well. So from minus infinity to minus one, we change it to plus infinity to one or one to plus infinity for the summation. It doesn't matter which is lower, which is upper limit. And then we are again looking at a series of common ratio. Uh, the common ratio is a to the power of minus one, z. One minus common ratio on the denominator the first term on the numerator, the first term is when e, n equals one. So a to the power of minus one, z to the power of one. Don't forget this minus sign at the beginning. So we always have this minus sign at the beginning. And then multiplying a on both numerator and denominator, we have z minus a minus z, which is z, z minus a. And the region of convergence for this signal again, it requires the common ratio to have a magnitude that is less than one. This time common ratio is Z divided by A. So the region of convergence is the magnitude of Z less than the magnitude of A. So because this is less than, then if we plot the region of convergence on the Z plane, on the complex plane, it is the region inside the circle. So the circle has radius, which is a magnitude. And the region of convergence is always inside that circle, not including the circle. That's why I plot the circle in dash line. It means the region of convergence does not include, does not include the circle itself. It's only the region strictly inside the circle. And there are two cases. One case is that A is magnitude larger than one, so A is to the right of one. The other uh, case is A magnitude less than one, so this red circle inside the unit circle. But for both cases, the region of convergence should be inside the red circle. Okay. One thing I didn't elaborate for the uh, example above and this example is that I didn't discuss when the Fourier transform, the discrete time Fourier transform exists or not. And it, this is related to the ROC. Let's come back to the last example when the region of convergence is outside of the red circle. For the case above, the red circle has a radius that's larger than one. So the region of convergence outside of the circle does not contain the unit circle. Unit circle is the circle, is the blue circle whose radius is one. And if the ROC does not contain the unit circle, then the Fourier transform does not exist. Why? Because if we come back to the beginning, where we obtain the Z transform, I said that the Fourier transform is just for the exponential J omega. Right? Exponential J omega is the space represented by the unit circle. So in other words, for the Fourier transform to exist, it must, the Z transform must be valid or must converge on the unit circle. But for the case above, the ROC does not contain unit circle. So the discrete time Fourier transform does not exist. For the case below, because the radius a magnitude is less than one, then the ROC, which is the region outside of this red circle, contains the blue circle, contains the unit circle. Therefore, in this case, the Fourier transform exists. Whether Fourier transform exists depending, depends on whether the ROC contains the unit circle. That is our conclusion. And this also applies to the second example. For the case above, the region of convergence is inside the red circle. It contains the blue unit circle. Therefore, the Fourier transform exists. But for the case below, the ROC inside the red circle does not contain the unit circle, the blue unit circle. So the Fourier transform does not exist for this case. And if we summarize the results of the two examples above on this slide, 
we see that, so this is the signal in the first example, the signal on the second example. Both signals have the same representation. It's the same expression of Z transform, right? Z divided by Z minus A, Z divided by Z minus A. So they have the same expression, but the ROC is different. For the first example, ROC is outside of A magnitude. The, for the second example, it's inside. And because A is a point, so when Z equals A, the denominator equals zero. From the last chapter, the Laplace transform, we know that such a point A is called the pole of the Z transform. In other words, the ROC for the first example is outside of the pole. The ROC for the second example is inside the pole. And whether outside or inside the pole depend is also related to the structure of the time domain signal. For the first signal, because of this U of n, we call it a right-sided signal because U of n is one when n is larger than equal to zero. And U of minus n minus one equals one from n equal minus infinity to minus one. So we call this signal left-sided signal. And we plot it in this way. It is left-sided, only non-zero on the left. So we have this general observation that when we have a right-sided signal, its Z transform has an ROC that is outside of the pole. We have a left-sided signal, then the Z transform has an ROC that's inside the pole. Remember that in Laplace transform, when the time domain signal is right-sided, then the ROC is to the right of the pole, to the right of the vertical line on the pole. If it's left-sided, then ROC is to the left. But for Z transform, we are not talking about left or right. We're talking about outside or inside for the ROC. Okay, uh, there, there are inverse Fourier, uh, inverse Laplace transforms, inverse Z transforms, but uh, the Due to the light time limitation, uh, the inverse transforms are not uh, in the scope of this course. Uh, I recommend you read the uh, textbook by Oppenheim Wilski. It contains a uh, detailed explanation for the inverse transforms. So let's look at one more example of the Z transform. Because this signal is a little bit more complicated, it has two parts. So added up, uh, the first part is a right side signal because it has U of N. The second part is left side signal has U of minus N minus one. Uh, I will give you three minutes to try to calculate the Z transform of this signal. And then we'll look at the, the answer together.
Okay. So <laughs> apply the standard formula x of n z to the power minus n infinite sum from n minus infinity to plus infinity. Now we need to discuss the summation uh, according to uh, different uh, ranges of n. For n, which is uh, from zero to plus infinity, on this region of n, the second term just disappear because we, we've seen that the second term is left sided signal. Then for n on the right side, the second term will just disappear. What is left is the first term, seven times one, to one divided by three to the power n times z to the power minus. And for, the, for n on this region, minus infinity to minus one, the first term of xn will disappear because the first term is right side, but we are looking at a, a region on the left. Only the second term is reserved, six times two to the power n times z to the power minus n. We can apply the formula for the summation of Commons, uh, commons uh, ratio theory. Seven, don't forget this constant coefficient. So the first term on the numerator is to the power zero, which is one. One minus the common ratio. One divided by three, z to the power minus one. And for the second term, so we again change from n to minus n, right? From n to minus n, therefore from minus n to n, and we need to change the uh, index region from minus infinity to minus one to plus one to plus infinity. And then the first term just simplified by multiplying z on both numerator and denominator Second term, applying the formula for the series of common ratio. Uh, on the, on the uh, numerator is the first term in the series, n equals one, so two to the power minus one, z to the power one, denominator one minus common ratio. Uh, simplify a little bit, this is the result. It's a uh, function of z, in particular, it's a summation of two terms each term is a rational function of z. Rational function means both numerator and denominator are polynomials of z. In this example, the polynomials are both a first order polynomials of z. But we need to discuss the region of convergence. Uh, this is where we can apply the previous result right? because we know that for right-sided signal, the region of convergence is outside of the pole. So for the first term, it is right side. The pole is when the denominator equals zero, uh, namely z equals one divided by three. So the ROC for the first term is z magnitude larger than the pole one divided by three. For the second term, because the second term is left side signal, then the ROC should be inside the pole. And the pole for the second term is z equals two because that is what makes the denominator zero. Therefore, inside the pole, it's, it says z magnitude less than two. And for the entire signal x of n to make sure that it's, for, uh, it's z transform converges, we need both ROCs to be satisfied. Therefore, we need z magnitude to be larger than one divided by three and smaller than two. In other words, it's the intersection of the two RLCs, which gives us this expression. And if plot it on the Z plane, larger than one divided by three, smaller than two, it is the ring between one divided by three and two. Oh, a student said it's a donut. I, that's also right. Uh, and this extends our previous observation. When the signal in the time domain, x of n, is two-sided, right? it has both right side part and the left side part, so this is called a two-sided signal, then the ROCs in general are ring between 
the two poles. And here I would like to ask a question whether the discrete time Fourier transform for X of N exists. So can someone quickly type it in the chat window? Does it exist or not? Okay. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, that's because of our previous result. When the ROC contains the unit circle, the Fourier transform exists. The unit circle with radius one is between one over three and two, so obviously contained in the ROC. So we have one more example, uh, Z transform. The first part and the U of N is the same to the previous examples, but we have a sinusoidal component in this X of N. Uh, for this kind of problem, uh, we convert sine pi divided by 4N using the Euler's formula to exponential j pi divided by 4n minus exponential minus j pi divided by 4n divided by 2j. And then we have exponentials in the signal that uh, for which we need to calculate the infinite sum. Uh, let's have a break here. Uh, try to uh, do this practice during the break and we come back at uh, 12.30. Right, twelve thirty. Right, uh, someone asked in the chat window whether there are cases in which the ROC do, does not exist. Uh, it is possible. And for this case, the ROC for the first term, the radius is smaller than the ROC, the radius of ROC of the second term. Therefore, there is a well-defined ring. But suppose that the ROC for the first term is, that the radius for the first term is larger than the radius for the second term. Then we, when we try to take the intersection of the two ROCs, the result is empty set. In that case, ROC does not exist. The Z transform does not exist. Okay, let's resume the lecture. I believe you had enough time to uh, calculate uh, this example. Let's look at the answer then. We first convert the sinusoidal signal to the difference of two exponential signals uh, using the Euler's formula. And uh, this makes the signal uh, split in two terms. The first term with exponential plus j pi divided by four, the second term minus j pi divided by four. If we use the standard formula for z transform x of n, z to the power minus n, and we need to again split as two terms for the first term plus j pi divided by four for the second term minus j pi divided by four. And the both terms are the summation of a series of common ratios. The common ratio for the first term is exponential plus j pi divided by four, z to the power minus one. Uh, the second term has the same structure, but with the minus sign in the exponent. So uh, for both terms, the summation is from n equals zero to plus infinity because the signal x of n for both terms uh, contains a uh, step signal u of n. Therefore, the series common ratio both start with uh, power zero, which is one on the numerator. And simplify a little bit is the difference between two rational functions of z. So this is the uh, Fourier transform, uh, sorry, the, the z transform expression for the signal x. Uh, how about its region of convergence, ROC? So for the first term, 
for the uh, summation of uh, series common ratio to be valid, we need the common ratio to, to have uh, magnitude less than one. The same for the second term. And in, in this expression, exponential j pi divided by four is magnitude is just one. And the same for exponential minus j pi divided by four. Then the, uh, the two conditions can be simplified to the same expression, z magnitude larger than one divided by three. We can plot these two points on the z plane. So one over three exponential j pi divided by four, it has magnitude one over three, so it lies on the circle whose radius is one over three. The angle is pi divided by four, so 45 degrees, right? 45 degrees counted from the positive horizontal axis. And it's, uh, uh, it's uh, complex conjugate has the same magnitude one over three, the angle is minus pi divided by four. So it's uh, counted clockwise from the horizontal axis. So these two uh, points on the Z plane are symmetric over the horizontal axis. Uh, they, are called the, uh, they are called the complex conjugate of each other. And they both lie on the circle, the dash red, red circle with the radius one over three. And the region of convergence, Z magnitude larger than one over three, which is the shaded area outside this circle. And this is also consistent with our observation that uh, when the signal is right-sided, right, because of this U of N, X of N is a right-sided signal, then the ROC is outside of the poles. So in this expression of Z transform, there are two poles, which are the two, uh, two points represented by the crosses. And for this case, the discrete time Fourier transform also exists because this ROC contains the unit circle with radius one. So one is here. So the unit circle is contained in the ROC. So the Fourier transform exists. Uh, this is the result we obtained for this example. Uh, we can make some optional simplification. So this simplification is now required in your homework or exam. Uh, so basically we can multiply the two uh, denominators. And for the numerator, it's the second denominator minus the first denominator. Uh, Considering out rele relevant terms, we have a, uh, a single term of Z with this coefficient on the numerator. And we can eliminate the common factors, and this is the result. So this, after this simplification, the structure of the result is uh, more, is clearer. So on the denominator, it has, it is a, a second order polynomial factorized so that we can see, we can clearly see the two poles, right? The two poles, the two points that make the, the denominator zero. These are the two poles as we plotted as the two crosses here. And on the numerator is a first order polynomial of Z. So one more example is uh, associated with this uh, special signal delta of n. We know it's discrete time unit in pulse. It takes value one when n equals zero, takes value zero otherwise. Uh, try to use the definition of Z transform to calculate the calculate Z transforms of these three signals, delta of n, delta of n minus one, delta of n plus one. So uh, two minutes.
Okay. So the answer to uh, doubt of n actually very uh, is the same as the uh, for uh, Fourier transform and Laplace transform for the previous impulse signals that we looked at. The result is just one. Why? Because we try to use the standard formula, delta of n times z to the power minus n. It's an infinite sum, but delta of n is everywhere at zero. Only one term is left. It is when n equals zero. When equals zero, z to the power minus zero is one. So it is one. This result is for all the z's. In other words, the ROC is the entire z plane. So what about delta of n minus one? Again, we use the formula, standard formula. Delta of n minus one is time shifting version of delta n. It equals one when n equals one, and it's zero everywhere. Therefore, this infinite sum actually only has one term which is when n equals one. In that term, z to the power minus n becomes z to the power minus one. And this is the expression for z transform of delta of n minus one. And because of this expression, it has a pole z because z to the power minus one, so z is on the denominator. Therefore, we must make sure that z is non-zero because the denominator cannot be zero. In other words, the ROC is the entire Z plane except the single point Z equals zero, except the point Z equals zero. What about delta of N plus one? So delta of N plus one, Z to the power minus N infinite sum. Again, this is infinite sum only retains one term, which is where the impulse occurs. The impulse occurs at N equals minus one. So z to the power minus minus one, which is z to the power one. So for this expression of uh, z transform to exist, we can have z everywhere on the uh, z plane, but magnitude of z cannot be infinity. So I put it here, magnitude of z not equal plus infinity. Why? We can compare it. So it is uh, analogous to the case where uh, Z is on the denominator. When Z is on the denominator, Z equals zero makes the Z transform infinite. So we don't want the Z transform to be infinite. Therefore, Z is non-zero. When Z is on the numerator for this case, we also need that the Z transform is finite. Therefore, its magnitude cannot be plus infinity. But in this course, um, it is okay to skip the discussion of Z magnitude equals plus infinity because this is a, is a very tricky case. If you want to be rigorous, that's fine. You can write in your answer that uh, Z is not plus infinity for a case like this. But if you don't write this, if you don't write Z now equal plus infinity, that is also okay. Because in, by default, we are considering the finite values of Z. Okay. So that's only for the last case, for the Z magnitude now equal plus infinity. In this course, it is okay to skip the, the state, this statement because by default, we consider finite z's. So one more example, x of n, a to the power n, but only on the finite region of time n, from zero to capital N minus one, where capital N is a given constant, and x of n is zero otherwise. For this signal, try to calculate its z transform. Uh, two minutes.
Okay. So for this signal, again, we use the standard formula, infinite sum x of n z to the power minus n to calculate its z transform. Uh, x of n is zero everywhere. So this infinite sum can be reduced to a finite sum. We only retain the terms that uh, are from n equals zero to capital N minus one. In this region of n, x of n can be uh, expressed as a to the power n, then multiply z to the power minus n. So this is a summation of a finite series of common ratio. So we used the, the formula for this series uh, before. In the numerator, it is the first term minus the last term multiplies additional common ratio. The first term is n equals zero, so it is one. The last term is n equals capital N minus one. We need to multiply it with an additional common ratio. So it becomes capital N here, capital N here. On the denominator, it's still the same, one minus the common ratio, a, z to the power minus one. Now we can simplify this expression a little bit. So the first step of simplification is to extract z to the power n on the denominator. This leaves the numerator. So this is one on the last step. When we extract z to the power n on the denominator, we need to multiply the numerator with z to the power n as well. So z to the power n minus a to the power n because this z to the power minus n is canceled by this denominator. So this is the first step of simplification. The second step on the denominator, z to the power n, we keep z to the power n minus one. And the z, the additional z, we multiply it with the denominator here, which becomes z minus a. So this is a simplified expression of x of z. We call it simplified because it does not contain z to the negative power. So every, every power of z is positive number which is clearer to see the order of polynomials for the denominator and numerator. So if you look at the denominator of x of z, it is in capital nth order polynomial z. So at first we may think that it has two poles. One pole is z equals zero. The other pole is z equals a. But it turns out that z equals a is not a pole because when z equals a, x of z actually takes a finite value, which is shown here. So if we multiply z minus a with this polynomial, so z to the power capital minus one to the power capital minus two times a until a constant term a n minus one, we just calculated this uh, this expression of two polynomials. And the next step, just multiply each term in the second polynomial with the first polynomial. So inside each pair of brackets, the first pair of bracket, it is z to the power n, z to the power n minus one minus times a. Right? So this is the first term times the, what is in the brackets. The second term times what's in the brackets this is the result. And the constant term multiplies the brackets, it's the last, last term in the brackets here. Now, if we break all the brackets, the second and third term, just they are the same with different signs, they cancel each other. The fourth and fifth term cancel each other, etc. And what is left is only the first term, z to the power n, and the last term minus a to the power. So the multiplication of these two polynomials are z to the power n minus a to the power n. In other words, if we divide z to the power n minus a to the power n by z divided by a, then the result is this polynomial, this n time n minus one order polynomial. This polynomial, when z equals a, every term is a to the power n minus one. There are n terms, so the result is n times a to the power n minus one. 
this is a finite value because n capital N is a finite integer that is given to us. A is a finite number. So the conclusion is for z equals a, x of z actually takes finite value. So z equals a is not a pole for x of z, although it is written on the denominator. The only pole for x of z is z equals zero. So the ROC of x of z is every z on the complex plane except the single point z equals zero. Right, this is a tricky case. I mean, the, the main thing that is tricky is that it's here. Although z, although z minus a is on the denominator, a is not a pole. So we've, uh, we've been looking at several examples to get familiar with the definition of z transform. And the important thing is to calculate the correct region of convergence. Now let's move on to the next topic, which are a set of properties of Z transform. You will find that these properties are similar to the previous properties of uh, discrete time Fourier transform, and uh, they correspond to uh, Laplace transform. Although Laplace transform is for continuous time, but there is some analogy between continuous and discrete time. So let's look at those properties. The first property, which I think is the most, uh, uh, which I think is the easiest to understand is linearity. It's quite straightforward. We consider two signals, X of N, Y of N. There are Z transform are capital X and capital Y. Then if we consider a new signal, A times XN plus B times YN, where A and B can be any complex constant numbers, then the Z transform of the new signal is A times capital X plus B times capital Y, uh, which is very similar to the previous linearity properties for all the transforms we've learned. But one thing we need to pay attention to is the change of region of convergence. For X and Y, the region of convergence for, for their respective Z transforms are R1, R2. And for the new signal, which is a linear combination of X and Y, it is natural to think that the region of convergence must be the intersection of R1 and R2, which was the case in this example, right? In this example, when the resulted ROC is a ring. But as a general law, the ROC might contain R1 intersecting R2. So it means it is possible that ROC is exactly R1 intersecting R2 or it might be a superset of R1 intersecting R2. Actually, we've explained the meaning of this word contains in last chapter, the Laplace transform. We look at two examples. The first example is ROC exactly equals R1 intersecting R2. The second example, ROC is a superset of R1 intersecting R2. There is a similar a philosophy for discrete time Z transform here as well. But uh, due to time limitation, I will not give two examples for this, uh, for this property. So in this lecture, let's just uh, quickly move on to go through all the uh, properties. And on the Friday lecture, if you still have time before finishing this chapter, I'll add some examples. Yes, that is case by case. So the, whether this contains means a superset or means equal, that needs case to case discussion. And similar to the Laplace transform, this case by case discussion depends on the poles of the Z transform. So we start that discussion from how many poles there are, and then it will become clear. But hopefully we will have time to look at an example. But if not, that's, that's okay. Because the Z transform, uh, to be honest, the Z transform is not a focus of our, uh, uh, our assessment, our examination. Uh, our main focus is on the continuous time, uh, the Laplace transform. So the time shifting property, 
X of N is Z transform is capital X of Z, ROC is R. Then we shift the signal by N zero. So when N zero is a positive integer, then we are shifting it to the right by N zero unit. If it's a negative integer, then we are shifting it to the left. But regardless of the direction, regardless of the sign of N zero, this always holds. So the Z transform of X N minus N zero is capital X multiplies additional term z to the power minus n zero. The region of convergence is almost unchanged. I say almost because it is r, except for possible addition or deletion of these two cases, z equals zero or z magnitude equal plus infinity. So this zero and plus infinity come up with this additional term z to the power minus n zero. For example, if we are shifting the signal to the right, in which case n zero is a positive integer, then multiplying z to the power minus n zero is, multi is uh, increasing the order of the polynomial on the denominator. That might introduce additional pole at z equals zero. And in that case, we must add z does not equal to zero to the ROC because the, the denominator cannot be zero. In another case, if N zero is a negative integer, then Z to the power of minus N zero is increasing the order of polynomial on the numerator. And for the Z transform to be finite, we require that the magnitude of z is not infinite. So in that case, we need to remove z magnitude equals plus infinity. So remove plus infinity from the ROC. So again, if we had time, we will look at the example. If not, then it is okay just for you to, to understand this, uh, this change. The ROC only need to know that it's almost unchanged because the zero and plus infinity cases are, are tricky as, as special cases. And in specific ex examples, it is not hard to judge whether or when we need to add zero or remove zero to the, to the region of convergence because you will see when there is additional pole z equals zero on the denominator. So the next property is related to the z domain scaling. For continuous time signals, when we look at Laplace transform, we discuss this time scaling property. But for discrete time signals, time scaling is a tricky case, right? Because when we express the signal over time, there may be samples that are lost. When we expand the signal over time, there are additional points for which we need to fill uh, additional information, usually we fill zero. So those are complicated cases which we will not discuss here. Here we discuss the simple case where Z is scaled by a uh, complex number Z zero. So X of N is Fourier transform, it's a Z transform, it's capital X of Z. ROC is R. Then if you look at this signal, there is a complex number Z0 to the power N multiplies X of N. This is again, this is also a signal over time N. This is a signal over time. Then it also has a Z transform. The Z transform for this signal is capital X, but we replace Z with Z divided by Z0. And the ROC also changes. ROC changes to R multiplies the magnitude of Z0. So how to understand this? In the previous chapter in Laplace transform, we learned the, uh, how to understand uh, ROC multiplies a constant, right? And for Z transform, when ROC is either inside or outside of a circle, 
you multiply it by a constant, we can understand as shown by the following figures. Say the figure on the left is an ROC. So we are considering ROC inside a circle as this yellow shaded area. So this ROC is denoted by R. Then if we take Z0 magnitude to be one half, in other words, the new ROC is R divided by two. How to understand that? We can understand it as a circle with a reduced radius. The radius is the half of the original circle. And the ROC is still inside the circle. So by dividing an ROC by a positive constant, we are shrinking the circle, but the direction of the ROC does not change. When I say the direction does not change, I meant when the original ROC is inside the circle, the new ROC is still inside the circle. And when Z0 magnitude equals two, so the new ROC is two times R, it is still inside the circle, but the circle has a radius that's two times the original radius. So a case that I didn't plot on this slide, but, a case, but is easier, easy to understand is, when the ROC is outside the circle, then we multiply the ROC by a positive constant. The new ROC is still outside the circle because as I said, multiplying a positive number does not change the direction of the ROC. Or the only thing that changes is the radius of the circle. So divided by two, then the circle shrinks and multiply by two, the circle, uh, the radius of the circle doubles. Uh, the next property is the time reversal property. So X of N is a discrete time signal. It's uh, Z transform is capital X of Z, ROC is R. Then we consider X of minus N, which is the time reversal of X of N. It's Z transform is capital X replacing Z with one divided by Z. And the ROC also changes to one divided by R. How to understand one divided by R? So if there is a point Z0 in the original ROC R, then the point one divided by Z0, which is also a complex number, is inside the set one divided by R. It is hard to uh, plot the set one divided by R in the figure. But intuitively, the set one divided by R is the set of reciprocals of all the points in the original RLCR. In other words, the original RLCR, it contains a set of points, a set of complex numbers. The reciprocals of all these complex numbers constitute a new set. This new set is called one divided by R. And this new ROC is understandable because originally we need to make sure that X of Z is valid or X of Z is finite or X of Z converges. So whichever way we express it, we need to make sure that X of Z is a valid expression on the region R. But for the new Z transform, we need to make sure that one X of one over Z is valid. In other words, one over Z needs to be in the set that makes X valid. So one over Z needs to, be, needs to be in the point in the, needs to be in the set R. And then Z needs to be in the set of reciprocals of R, one over R. That's an intu intuitive interpretation of the, the, the region one over R. Again, it is hard, for this case, it's hard to plot it on the figure. So I can only explain it in this way. I need some abstract understanding. Okay. Uh, and here I give the proof of this property. We are calculating the Z transform of X of minus N, applying the standard formula X of minus N, Z to the power minus N infinite sum from minus infinity to plus infinity. The first step is to substitute n 
with minus m or substitute minus n with m. So we change minus n to m, minus n to m, x of m, z to the power m. Because of this substitution, n equals minus infinity is equivalent to m equals plus infinity. Plus infinity changes to minus infinity. But we can flip it back because for infinite sum, the which is lower, which is upper bound does not matter. The result is still the same. We put minus infinity on the lower on the lower bound. X of m does not change. Z to the power m we can express as one divided by z to the power minus m, because one divided by z is z to the power minus one. Two minus signs, it is equal to the z to the power of m. And then the next step, we're doing nothing, but only changing m to n again. We change m back to n. The infinite sum does not change because it is just the index, right? Whether the index is m, whether it is n, whether it is k, does not matter. The result does not change. Have a look at this expression. We compare it with the standard formula for x of z. We know that x of z is x of n z to the power minus n infinite sum. Now we are looking at infinite sum x of n, one divided by z to the power minus n. So this expression and this expression is only different in that we change z to one divided by z. So it is x z in this formula, then it is x of one divided by z in this form. From the beginning, the z transform of x minus n is capital X one divided by Z, which gives this pro time reversal property. Okay. The next property is the Z domain differentiation. Recall that in the Laplace transform, we learned the property for both time domain differentiation and the S domain differentiation. Here, we only look at the Z domain differentiation because uh, N is a discrete time. So we cannot take a derivative over N. Uh, we can take a difference over N, such as X of N minus X of N minus one, but X of N minus one is actually obtained from the time shift of property, right? Time shift of property when N zero equals one. Therefore, we did not discuss the time domain difference or time domain differentiation in the Z transform, we'll only look at a Z domain differentiation. But in particular, if we have signal X of N, whose Z transform is capital X, region of convergence is R, then we take the right-hand side, it's derivative over Z, so dx dz, multiply it by additional minus Z. So the right-hand side is still a function of Z. Then it is the Z transform of n times x of n. So the left hand side is a new signal over time n. It's still a discrete time signal. The region of convergence does not change. So how to prove this property? Let's just calculate the z transform of the signal n times x of n by applying the standard formula. So the signal n times x of n is here for every time n multiply z to the power minus n, infinite sum over n. This is a standard form. We can extract minus z from every term of this infinite sum. Then what is left in every term is minus n, z to the power minus n minus one. So there is a minus sign here, there's a minus sign here, two minus signs, therefore on the last step, there's no minus sign. z to the power minus n minus one, Multiply this z becomes z to the power minus n. Nxn, nxn. So we are not missing anything. So why we write it in the brackets in this way? Because this is the derivative of the term z to the power minus n divided by z. So ah, a question from, by the way, uh, a question from the chat window is how do the, how to do complex variable differentiation? That's a good question. Uh, 
And in this lecture, I didn't prepare a slide uh, to explain it. Uh, in the next lecture, uh, I will add a detailed explanation of a derivative over a complex number C. I will do that. But if you only look at the expression, uh, the form of the derivative is not different from the de derivative real number. So z to the power minus n, take a derivative over z, we have minus n, the coefficient extracted at the beginning, and then we decrease the order of this, uh, this term by one, so minus n minus one. And we assume that there is a set of mathematical conditions that are always satisfied so that we can swap the order of infinite sum and derivative. And this, this, this change of order of operators needs some conditions, but here in our course, we assume those conditions always met. There's no concern about it. So linearity of the derivative just says it is the derivative of the entire infinite sum x of n z to the power minus n d dz. And what is this inside the brackets? This is the z transform of the original signal x of n. In other words, this is capital X of z. So what we obtain is minus z times d capital X dz. This proves the z domain differentiation property. The last property of Z transform is the convolution. Now again, it is analogous to the convolution property of the Laplace transform. We have two signals. Here we denote them by X and H. That Z transform are respectively capital X and capital H. ROCs are respectively R1, R2. If we have a new signal, YFN, which in the time domain is the convolution of X and H, then the Z transform of small y denoted by capital Y is the multiplication of XZ, HZ. So this is the standard multiplication for every Z. This is very similar to the Fourier transform and Laplace transform, right? And the region of convergence. So as a general law, ROC contains R1 intersection R2. This is similar to the linearity property because uh, we need to make sure that both the uh, ROC for both X and H is satisfied. And in the example that you will see on Friday lecture, you'll find that most of the cases ROC exactly equals R1 intersecting R2, but there are cases, there are rare special cases the ROC is a superset of R1 intersecting R2. This often happens when there is an elimination of a pole. When the pole is eliminated, the ROC can be expanded, can be broadened. In that case, ROC is a superset of R1 intersecting R2. Otherwise, if the poles does not change, the ROC usually equals R1 intersecting R2. For the convolution property, it is related to the application of Z transform to discrete time LTI system. I will, uh, I will elaborate on the Friday lecture. This will also be the last piece of information in uh, this term. Okay. Uh, this is the end of today's lecture. Uh, I will see you on Friday. Thank you.